Part 5. Strictly for Therapeutic Purposes Ronan climbed inside the luxury vehicle and almost remarked that it smelt brand new. The car veered off on a predetermined trajectory and was responsive to every curve and contour of the road with the utmost precision. Ronan's praise of the new car smell was curtailed due to the source of the aroma being the fumes from Kinsey's electronic vaporizer. The device contained a fluorescent orange substance that smelled of burnt plastic and laundry detergent. Kinsey's eyes would become dilated for several seconds before returning to normal as he inhaled the mysterious liquid in intervals. The song 21st Century Schizoid Man by Flower Travel and Ban played on a stereo system that made the century-old song sound like high definition. Kinji began to speak and the volume of the music was reduced by the vehicle's ECU, compensating for the audibility of his speech in accordance to both the music's volume and the vehicle's RPM. We're off to one of my holistic medicine businesses I open to pander to the yoga and meditation enthusiasts, Kinsey explained. Ronan eyed the council of the dashboard, which indicated the GPS course was en route. Tanning salon, flotation therapy, guided meditation, homeopathy, and holistic medicine. Ronan read to himself the description of Kenji's business entitled Therein Why Tanned. I need your assistance with some of the machines at my business, Ron. Kenji winked to insist he was referring to Ronan's American identity strictly for tax purposes. Are you offering me a job? Ronan shrugged at the proposal. Kenji pocketed the card he had gifted Ronan earlier and stated, I am offering you a whole lot more than a job. The vehicle had arrived at a parking garage, which went underneath a building. The vehicle found a vacant spot. The music stopped and the engine seized. Are you hungry? Kinsey suggested. Ah, I could eat. Ronan replied plainly. Good, Kinsey said. He stepped out of the vehicle, and it began to alarm itself with a few deliberate beeps and an audible pneumatic walking mechanism. This luxury vehicle is far more than a stock model made available to the common public, Ronan thought to himself in appreciation. The unlikely duo approached an elevator conveniently situated nearby. The elevator chimed open, and Kenji hit the topmost floor and lit a cigarette. Ronan eyed the cigarette and felt inclined to bum one off him before Kenji predicted his intentions. Sorry, I'd offer you a cigarette, but these are very special, Kenji insisted. I didn't realize you smoked, Ronan admitted. I don't, Kenji said with a wink. The elevator had arrived and Kenji must not have been lying because he wheezed and hacked up phlegm as the doors opened. Immediately in front of the elevator was a concrete wall with a single door labeled maintenance, which Kenji unlocked with a swipe from Ronan's re-gifted card. The pair entered into a small loft which contained a kitchen and several homely devices which were programmable dependent on the user's needs. The annexed room resembled Ronan's dwelling with a less civilized and metallic taste. A bathroom was visible at the far end of a small hall, and Ronan excused himself as Kenji tended the kitchen, where a lukewarm pot of lobster awaited. Kenji's cigarette smoke was abated by the kitchen's large industrial fans. The sound of an electronic appliance turned on, and after a brief moment, Ronan greeted Kenji back in the kitchen. The seating arrangement appeared to be the same furniture at the tea shop except the atmosphere of the complex consisted almost entirely of chrome. Even the toilet, bathtub, and sink were all state-of-the-art. In spite of the overwhelming amount of metal there, there were several mounted portraits of Shoko Asahara and a painting of traditional samurais with 
swastikas on the helmets. Rondon took a seat at one of the bar stools at a stainless steel polished countertop in the kitchen. An approximately 64-inch LCD display was mounted inside of a steel wall in what could be described as a living room. The same modern seating arrangement from the tea shop was readily available. The TV was skipping through channels, revealing what appeared to be surveillance footage from the rest of the building and the surrounding premises. Come, sit in the dining room, not at the bar. You're hungry, remember? Kenji offered. Kenji cracked open some lobster tails and placed them on a large plate, which held butter and cocktail sauce. Kinsey began to laugh hysterically to himself out loud. Ha <laughs> ha! I love lobster, Kinsey remarked. Ronan took a seat at one of the familiar lounge chairs and began to indulge in some of the lobster tails placed on the table. Kinsey appeared infatuated with himself and was pleased at being a venerable host for his hungry guest. The complex catered to a demographic of mainly college-aged women. The embedded TV set showed tanning beds with glimpses of the vulnerable attendees. The voyeuristic images were disconcerting to Ronan, who between bites took notice of the women lying bare, basking in artificial sunlight. Their enlightened was offered as an exclusive getaway to the upper echelons of a nameless sorority which consists of Japanese and Americans. Here at their right hand, women are free to immerse themselves in all matters of decadence. There are suites available for extended visits at our salon. Women are welcome to invest their time in order to obtain the skills to become licensed healers. Kinsey boasted about the images filtering into the screen. I cook, and June organizes our hand-selected clientele, Kinsey continued. The TV screen switched to several women who were undergoing Reiki therapy. The sides of the room were decorated with posters of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life and the seven-colored chakra systems. A stack of yoga mats could be seen, indicating the room served multiple purposes for a given occasion. The front of the room had full-length mirrors for observing yoga posture. The rear of the room contained a singular mirror, which had a black silk blanket draped over it. Ronan speculated the mirror served as a psychomantium for scrying. The blanket, he assumed, was used to simulate rebirth for a group healing ceremony, colloquially known as a group smothering. An older woman's hands were placed atop the crown of the youngest initiate. Ronan speculated the girl was anywhere between 15 to 18 years old, and the others were in their mid-twenties. The older girls were meddling with an assortment of crystal gemstones in golden Tibetan bowls, droning an unintelligible chant. There were seven silk cushions which the girls were seated on while the oracle led her group meditation with their youngest member at the focal point. Kenji's pose was becoming more and more perplexing to Ronan. The pair eavesdropped on the remainder of their session while feasting upon the lobster tails. June told me something interesting today, Ronan started. Did she now? Kenji smirked before continuing. Yes, we were both married at one point, before we had a fresh start, Kinji replied. But she's so much... Ronan began before being interrupted. Younger than I, Kinji took the words from Ronan's mouth. Let me ask you something. How old do you think I really am? Kinji inquired. Ronan assessed Kinsey's complexion and the subtle grayness of his hair. He did not wish to flatter Kinsey, but he began to make an estimate based upon fair judgment. I'd say you're in your late 50s or mid 60s, Ronan concluded. Kinsey gave Ronan a look of keen discernment and concealed a laugh when he replied, What if I told you that I'm more than double that age? 
Ronan considered the serious temperament of Kinsey's continence and admitted, Then the years have treated you well. That must have been your first cigarette at the true. Kinsey relinquished a heartfelt laugh and calmly stated, Yes and no. Ronan shrugged at the comment and began to wonder about Kinsey's true past in Osaka. Integrating human consciousness into technology was the primary tenet of Japan's transhumanist agenda. I stand before you as proof of that concept, Kinsey explained. So you're a cyborg, Ronan observed out loud. Kinsey released a sigh of relief but shook his head. If only it were that simple. I'm not like those demonstrable cowards that fear death. Kinsey attempted to explain, but was becoming detached from the conversation. Transhuman implants get rejected by the limbic system over time. This explains why his status appeared suicidal earlier. That is, if he's lying, Ronan kept to himself. The television now switched to a network of dormant sensory deprivation tanks. There was a night vision lens which would typically illuminate the partially submerged occupants in a green hue. Ronan was familiar with the engineering design of the vacant chambers which utilized a saline solution to make the user buoyant within the water. An infrared thermometer scanned the surface of the inhabitant's skin to regulate the water temperature to within a hundredth of a degree in tolerance. This technology induced those residing within the sensory deprivation chambers into a sense of oneness. A plethora of meditational benefits could be achieved, and Ronan had heard the patrons of Supremely All Tea speak fondly of their experiences. The effects of sensory deprivation were heightened when coupled with psychedelics. This is why I need your level of expertise, Kinsey illustrated. You need a tech guy for the sensory deprivation chambers, Ronan detracted. Yes, that is why I have taken you here today, for the complimentary meal and the various benefits this job has to offer. Kinsey stood up too fast and waved the card around, seemingly intoxicated due to the blood rushing to his brain. There's been a bit of an after-hours mishap with one of the tanks, Kinsey confessed. Ronan's eyes beamed at the thought of Kinsey experimenting with psychotropics in brave wave entrainment. The forbidden sciences of the mesmerists were considered quackery. Yet Kenji had hinted at not only pursuing these ambitions, but mastering them. What sort of mishap? Ronan asked eagerly. Kenji sighed vigorously and became agitated. Let's just say it was more of an experiment gone awry. Ronan's imagination led him to presume that someone sabotaged the machine's components during a bad drug trip. In this questionably regulated facility, Drug-addled paranoia appeared to be a powerful indoctrination tool. Images appeared on the screen of some of the college girls performing ASMR in their private quarters. As a means for college funds, they were tending phantasmal appendages which had been subdued within the rift of virtual reality. Kinsey opened the entrance door and suggested to Ronan, You better come take a look. The elevator door slid open and Kenji punched the button for the first floor below them. There was another concrete wall which immediately impeded their progress before being opened by Kenji's card. The room appeared to be a boiler room for custodial purposes. There were numerous tools for repairs, ranging from cordless drills to implements for troubleshooting electronics, such as multimeters. In the center of the room was a sensory deprivation chamber, which was lit by several light sensors. Kenzie unceremoniously opened the tank, unveiling a frothing batter of stewed human flesh. Scalding hot water had peeled the epidermal layer of skin off the corpse of a boy, exposing their human nervous system 
down to vein and muscle. Fuck! Bronin shouted in response to the crime he was now an accomplice in. There were a series of wires and metal plates attached to the skull, which provided an encephalography display for the tank's control panel. Kenzie's operation served as a playground for an unbridled form of twisted neuropathy. The stench of the cadaver's last voided movement filled the air. Don't worry, it was just a designer baby. They're completely disposable, Kenzie teased. What the hell were you planning with your goddamn experiment? Ronan pleaded. To cause the consciousness of the host to become disembodied from their body. Under the proper circumstance, and with an immense threshold for pain, the mind is capable of projecting one's consciousness into an astral light body, Kenji elaborated. You tortured the kid, Ron had determined, coming down slightly after the explanation. Don't be ridiculous. I think we can both agree a test tube baby is hardly a human at all. This was a willing participant. A test subject who endeavored toward a foretold limitless potential. Designer children were recruited until their inevitable truth became reality, and that they never contained a hint of humanity. They are an imitation of creation, which feigns inherent altruism. Their spirits flourished on the dreams and aspirations of others while their souls were ingrained with the ulterior motives from their creators. Their single purpose in life is to fulfill a false sense of divinity. What do you need me for? Ronan asserted with a primal sense of survival. He began to eye potential weapons around the room to fend himself off from the body snatcher. Relax! You are not a brainwashed candidate capable of projecting consciousness, Kenzie reassured Ronan. We are at war, Ronan. A social sinso is at hand, and this is our time of reckoning. You may not be capable of projecting your consciousness, but I assure you, I am. Kenzie resigned. You need me to help you commit suicide. Ronan finally deduced from the situation. This young man was an augmented clone of mine, embedded with various implants. I selfishly held June hostage by gaslighting and blackmailing her for nearly 80 years. Because I wanted my woman to stay young, I transplanted her consciousness into a soulless automaton. After years of human trafficking, I lived nearly three human lifespans, and my research is finished. I am ready to die, at least physically. This isn't even my original body. I've accomplished what geneticists can only dream of. We cannot allow this technology to fall into their hands, so I'm asking you to assist me in expropriating my consciousness. I will have no personality or physical form to assume. The algorithms you experienced earlier were a corruption brought about by my crone, who was part of a remote viewing and astral projection project. When I die, I will be rendered into an artificial intelligence which supersedes virtual reality. I will experience all the sensations offered and finally reap the benefits of the seeds I have sown for decades on end. How do you plan on dying? Ronan relented. You see these cigarettes? Kenzie presented a pack of cigarettes from his lab coat. They've been laced with so much PCP in approximately 15 to 20 minutes. I'll be in such a dissociative state, I'm likely to chew my own lip off or go on a rampage. What about your dead clone? Ronan uttered at the boiled dead body. I've been working on some alchemical concoctions derived from a special mixture of mercury, fluoride, and hydroxide. I call it corrosive inductive fluid. I've used it in some successful extractions of gold from hair, 
toenails and dental fillings when disposing of some irritating members who undergo chrysotherapy. If you place its body in the bathtub, you'll notice there are electronic devices retrofitted inside. Those aren't for bubbles, mind you. Pour at least 30 gallons of the mixture and turn on the electrical conductor. The supplies are upstairs in the kitchen, Kinsey concocted. Real appetizing, Ronan remarked at Kinsey's tastelessness. Let's get him on a cart. I'll grab him by the arms, you grab him by the legs, Kinsey offered. He began to peel off the EEG apparatus, which was wired to the boy's head. The couple strained with a considerable effort to hoist the cadaver onto a cart, which typically held electronic equipment. The boy weighed at least 125 pounds and appeared to have been bogged down by absorbing the saline solution. Kinsey gave Ronan his card and instructed him to drop the body into the bathtub upstairs. Meanwhile, I'm going to find a clean chamber for me to die in, Kenji relished. Ronan complied nervously, but without protest, he took Kinsey's card and opened the elevator, which played dissonant atonal music with vibraphones and glass harmonicas. The effect was almost soothing. It made him scoff at the irony that somewhere within the building they had people meditating in tranquility to this calming yet disturbing peace, and meanwhile he was in the midst of committing a horrendous act. The elevator door opened and Ronan cleverly carted the body forward to keep the elevator ajar and from departing. Although he seriously doubted anyone else had access, he wasn't going to take any chances, considering Kenji's deteriorating mental condition and potential lack of foresight. The room opened and it smelled of buttered lobster tails. Ronan proceeded toward the bathroom and leveraged the cart sideways to tilt the body off into the tub like a runaway wheelbarrow that had tipped over. The body thudded into the metal tub with a resounding echo that provided a crescendo to the music which was playing earlier. This is what happens when you give a designer baby free will, Ronan shrugged. Ronan went back to the kitchen with an emptied five-gallon bucket, which was conveniently filled with some tools which were now littered at the bottom of the tool cart. He searched the bottom drawers of the kitchen, and beneath the sink he noticed there was an additional dishwashing sprayer. He pointed the nozzle into the sink and opened the valve. A silverish metallic substance sprayed, which smelt of vinegar. This must be Kenji's special formula, Ronan thought to himself. He was cautious to not overfill the bucket and spill the contents. It took seven or eight trips back and forth before he was satisfied with the amount of chemicals in the tub. Finally, the body appeared to be thoroughly immersed, despite the contorted way in which the limbs were skewed. Ronan turned on the jets of the bathtub, and a plastic smell enveloped the vicinity. The liquid metal did not appear to conduct a lot of heat, however the applied electric current heightened the corrosive effects of the mixture. Ronan turned on the bathroom fan, which he immediately noticed was an industrial one, and it was an absolute overkill for any conventional bathroom. He left to join Kenji back on the floor below, not wishing to watch the synthetic decomposition process transpire. On the way out, he noticed the TV had switched to a public access channel on the free media platform. With a single glance, he determined it to be an independent news report about a meditation festival on Mount Rainier, which was in commemoration of the hyped astrological event. Ronan exited the metal loft, wheeling the cart out with him. The elevator doors instantly opened, indicating it was awaiting on the same floor and never departed. The elevator music had changed to contemporary jazz. On the floor below, Kenji's cart opened the door to reveal Kenji had been hard at work pouring bottles of bleach into the defecated contents of his clone's deathbed.
Kinsey had also somehow managed to retrieve a second sensory deprivation chamber from somewhere else within the building. Kinsey's eyes appeared dilated and bloodshot from the effects of the waste cigarette he had been smoking earlier. He began to clumsily unravel a series of rubber hoses, which were connected to a massive hot water heater. I'm losing sensation in my extremities, Kinsey cautioned. Ronan assisted Kinsey in attaching the hoses to the new chamber. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Ronan offered haphazardly. I am long overdue for death, and this body is about to be fried beyond repair anyway, Kinsey reassured Ronan. He stripped down and threw away all sense of modesty in front of Ronan. He struggled to reattach the EEG machine to his bald head and began to smash the electrical probes into his skull using an unrestrained strength from his fist. When I climb into the tank, run the ascension program on the display, and then turn on the valve from the hot water heater, Kenji instructed. Why don't you go to the spa and enjoy a mud bath in the meantime? You don't have to sit and watch me boil. It will take several cycles of the saline solution to circulate before I enter my final trance. It will gradually get hotter as I meditate, Kenji foretold. Ronan gulped nervously and did as he was ordered after Kenji stumbled erratically into his metal tomb. The sound of water being churned with the solution could be heard outside the tank. However, only darkness and silence permeated within. A countdown sequence had been initiated after the ascension program was selected. Ronan had fulfilled his end of the bargain, although he immediately wondered how he would dispose of Kenji's remains unassisted. He searched through the pockets of Kenji's clothing and found his wallet, keys, a pack of PCP waste cigarettes, and a lighter. As a last gesture of consideration, Ronan turned off the lights to assure Kenji had no interference from the outside world. He sighed in remorse and ventured back up to the loft to check on the process of the clone's dissolution. The water had turned brackish black and bubbled intermittently. Thankfully, the fan had relieved him of any foul stench. He shut the door and sat down in the living room and hung his head with both palms planted on his forehead and elbows resting atop the quadriceps of his legs. The television display flickered and his eyes caught a flash of red light which read, Breaking News. An attractive Japanese news correspondent which resembled June was standing before a scenic outcrop of the Puget Sound and the skyline of Seattle. The United States Geologic Survey has informed us of seismic activity along the Seattle fault line and throughout the Puget Sound. Numerous foreshocks were detected which may precede a larger event. We urge all citizens to seek shelter in an orderly fashion. Please follow all tsunami and volcano evacuation routes and await further instructions. An ominous Mount Rainier was looming in the background, with a small plume of smoke towering above it. The public access channel appeared to have been wept unattended, and the orators were no longer heard. An outcrop of tents and gazebos could be seen, and it looked as though a herd of rhinoceros had stampeded through the place, which sounded like a freight train could be heard, and a grayish-brown volcanic mud flow enveloped the camera until only white noise could be seen and heard. Awahar inundated the participants of the festival and a series of small earthquakes and volcanic eruptions ensued, which reverberated within the metal of the building. Son of a bitch, Ronan said to himself in awe at the events taking place. After a few unsettling moments, the emergency broadcast system confirmed the worst. Ronan's heart sank at the sound of the noise which offered no comfort. Text began to scroll across the screen, 
and read almost verbatim the news reporter's previous statement. I don't believe this, Ronan said to himself out loud. The screen went to black, and large white characters appeared on the screen.